Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our first Paris IIS Ideas. My name is Paulius. I am the scientific director at the Paris Institute for Advanced Study. Um, this is a new speaker series that we are inaugurating today in which we will feature um, short talks, 20-minute uh, talks from um, fellows that are coming to the Institute uh, for one month in a short writing residence program in which they will be writing um, the definitive version of an idea or concept they have been working on uh, for years. This could be on, on uh, research as researchers or as practitioners in a, in a position of responsibility. Um, and we will have one, one session of talks every month on the first or the second Friday. We will send you all reminders um, since you registered for this talk. Um, and in each session, we will have um, two, three, or four of these short talks on very different topics, but uh, that are um, exciting ideas from our institute. Um, today, for this first talk, we only have uh, one. Um, we will have uh, Juan Pablo Caicedo. Uh, Juan Pablo uh, is our first fellow in this program. Um, and he's a master in public administration and urban planning from Harvard University. He's also a lawyer and literature uh, graduate from the Universidad de Los Andes. Um, and more relevant for today, he's the manager at the Bogota Mayor's Office of um, this uh, project of urban renewal in one of the most important avenues in Bogota. Um, he's also a lecturer in political science at the Universidad Javeriana in Bogota. Um, so I will give the floor to Juan Pablo in just a moment. The way this is going to work is that we will have the 20 minute talk and then um, we will have 30 minutes for questions. You can either uh, write your questions uh, during the talk in the chat, and then I will read them at the end, or you can just wait and use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, I think that's it. So welcome, Juan Pablo. Thank you for joining us, and go ahead. Hi, Paulius. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me um, today. I'm very happy to, to present some of the work that we've been doing in, in the city of Bogota around this big project called Corredor Verde Septima or Green Corridor uh, of Avenue Septima um, in Bogota. I also want to thank uh, Paris um, IAS, the Institute of Advanced Studies, for having me here this month trying to um, consolidate some of these key ideas that we've been working on from the city of Bogota. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, what I want to do is to basically describe a little bit what this project is about and then connect it or try to connect it or suggest some connections between this project um, and the 15-minute framework, 15-minute uh, uh, city framework worked uh, by Carlos Moreno here in, in the city of Paris. Uh, and how this uh, project, we think, is a way to sow kind of the consolidation of this aspiration of having 15-minute infrastructure uh, very close to everyone, every single one of the residents of the city. So without further ado, let's start. Let's just have a brief conversation about what Septima Avenue is in the city of Bogota and why this is an important uh, place and, and corridor for the city, specifically, what I want to show you first is how this in the 1920s was actually what in current urban planning policy would be denominated as a complete street, right? Like a place in which there is no conflict between different users uh, of the street. You have public transit as a priority. You have pedestrians walking around and some private cars as well enjoying uh, a city at a human scale with a lot of commerce in the first floor. You know, most of the things that you actually aspire right now in modern um, urban theory, 
you could see them in Bogota in 1920, no? But you, now we're gonna see how this has evolved throughout time. And this is very common in many cities throughout the world, right? How uh, as private car infrastructure becomes may, maybe the main priority of most of the cities, uh, also uh, city governments just start investing more in you know segregating some of that very close space between um, buildings and walkable environments into more efficient uh, kind of infrastructure for particularly private cars, as well as distances start to grow apart and 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 as you need to connect more and more citizens coming to town to the downtown infrastructure. Right now, this was the last renovation that this corridor has had. This is 19 early 1970s or late 1960s. And this is how the corridor looks right now, right? There's a lot of conflict, a lot of unsafeness uh, for, for walkability, for bikers, for uh, even for private car users and for public transit users. This is basically a chaos that we've been trying uh, in, in the city of Bogota to renovate and to work through for the last 25 years, right? So this just for you to have a little bit more context uh, is a very important and critical corridor that actually is sowed very close to the eastern hills of the city, which is probably the most important ecologic uh, asset that the city of Bogota has. Uh, and it, it has been growing uh, as the city has been developing further north. So where you see far right on your screen, Calle 26 would be city downtown where, where the city started developing. And then as you go all the way north uh, to the left of your screen, you see the city limit uh, in the north, right? And Septima really shows the city uh, as the Eastern Hills accompany its development, which also makes it super challenging uh, for a lot of different communities and uses. This is the actual uh, state of art right now of the, of, of the, of the corridor. I mean, as, as you can see some of the pictures between what's happening near 200th Street, uh, where connect, regional connectivity should start, is not in very good condition. There is no quality public transit, although this is a public transit corridor, more than 70% of the, of the users of the corridor are actually commuters by public transit, and they're stuck in traffic uh, for very, very long periods of time. Uh, also, sidewalks are in very poor shape, they're not secure, they're not accessible, and public spaces are horrible as well, right? There's a lot of patrimony very close to Septima. We have the national parks, we have uh, the city's World Trade Center and economic kind of uh, force, and many other places, uh, government houses, um, Palace of Justice, the Congress, etc. But this, this, this is the current state, which is uh, not, not great, right? So what are we talking about when we talk about a green corridor and why we think is the actual best opportunity for a corridor like this one, right? And basically, if, if you walk down through history in trying in the city of Bogota, trying to renew this corridor is very difficult, right? We have tried literally every single possible transit project in Septima Avenue. We tried uh, underground metro. We tried to structure a tram. We try to structure heavy BRTs or bus rapid transit technology, which is what the city of Bogota is mostly known or renowned uh, worldwide, right? But none of them had have actually stick. There's nothing to that that we could pursue into into actually the final the final stages of construction, which we're right now in this project transitioning towards, right? And our diagnosis in the city of Bogota basically drives. Uh, for different things. Number one, most of these projects have been public transit driven projects, right? The city has only focused in trying to uh, accommodate some public transit infrastructure without thinking about what the street actually means to people and, uh, and many other uh, dimensions that are critical to, to a project like this, right? There is no holistic approach. There is no sensitivity whatsoever in many of the city design responses to the to the avenue's ethos, and it's important in the history of the city. As I was telling you before, this is a very important uh, place where people aspire, you know, uh, uh, that things should actually look like the identity of the city. 
pretty much as it might be Broadway Street in New York City or even in some cities say here in Paris, right? The, this critical, uh, very much historically heavy places where people really want to see that most of their imaginaries as a citizen or as an inhabitant of a city or even as a part of a country's imaginary should be recognized and the city hasn't been able to kind of sow that uh, in, in a correct manner either, right? There is no ecologic sensibility or solution whatsoever in, in many of these projects that we've been working around for the past 25 years. And as I was showing you a minute ago, this actually becomes a very important place. For, for economic, for ecologic life and biodiversity, right? And as well, there is no quality public space design. There is no sensibility towards making this actually a place, right? Only moving people from A to B uh, in, the most, in the most efficient way possible. We think that all of these concepts should be uh, repurposed, you know? And in the end, to build what we call a green corridor, right? Which is actually a manifesto in favor of this territorial and social identity of the city, right? Which is also a project that is respectful and integrates biodiversity. And we're gonna see in a minute how, and aims to demonstrate how this, this city can be built from an ecology and sustainability perspective, not only from a sustainable mobility perspective, which is also critical, of course, for adaptation and climate change, but also in terms of landscaping architecture and really building uh, high quality streets that really uh, support and promote clean forms of uh, mobility, right? So this is part of the process that we've been working for the last almost four years. This started as a vision of Mayor uh, Claudia Lopez where she wanted to really revisit uh, all of the projects in Septima and try to consolidate a different approach and a different idea uh, more around these three R's of uh, reverdecer which is regreen right recuperate and revitalize uh, public spaces giving them different uses just for you to know her tenure started in 2020 right in the midst of the the COVID crisis and this of course uh, was critical for many cities to understand the importance of public spaces uh, for many of the social purposes of actually living in cities. And in that sense, we also started a very ambitious, and we're going to discuss it in a second, participation and engagement process in which we wanted to understand with different residents, but of course, uh, academics and other members of society, what would be the real and best focus for a project in SEPI, right? And, and this participation axis is critical because most of the other projects uh, have not been able to pursue construction because of a participation issue, because there's been some organization around uh, or opposition around these projects because of how important the corridor is, right? And in that sense, we were able through different tactics that we're gonna show in a second uh, to build three different pillars, which we're gonna develop uh, a little bit further in, in which we had a cohesive narrative uh, around sustainable mobility, not only public transit, uh, ecologic harmony in design, right? And a sense of place. And I'm gonna discuss a little bit how, what this means and why that's important. For that, we had a lot of uh, allies outside of the city, Gale Architects, which is a huge architecture firm uh, founded by Jan Gale, which is probably the most important urbanist in the 20th uh, century that really focused most of his work in bringing back the focus of, of city building into human the human experience. Uh, and then Agen Stair here uh, in Paris, Anidom, which is an engineering firm in, in Spain and Colombia, also help us a lot in trying to consolidate these concepts towards uh, a structuring of detailed engineering, which we've already achieved. So this was also a, a part of a huge discussion, political discussion in the city, in which we wanted to really uh, give the city a new vision code or zoning code where sustainable mobility and this uh, permeability and connection between what the Eastern Hills uh, and, and, and the side of the river uh, all the way west uh, of the city border uh, really were about, right? The agents there here in France referred it as an ecoton, Septima as a, as a possible connection or transition environment between uh, what was happening in the hills and what would happen in the river, 
right? And this accessibility and this way of focusing um, infrastructure towards a more uh, sensible connection between what's happening very close to us uh, in, in the hills and how we move and what we're devoting space to was also critical uh, for the building of this concept. Right now, I'm gonna discuss quickly why um, we think it's important to also consider a 15-minute city approach uh, and how this project tries to sow around uh, that concept as well, right? The building blocks of a 15-minute city are basically these four, participation, proximity, solidarity, and ecology. Uh, in terms of participation and solidarity is how you give the chance for people to actually engage with the infrastructure and the projects that cities are pursuing and how they will be the guardians of these projects and they will somehow help city to develop them. And then proximity, of course, is having, is probably the key idea in this concept, which is having uh, a lot of services at at least a 15 minute uh, walk or bike ride, right? All of the services that a human needs uh, uh, from a city, which can be, you know, healthcare, education, uh, entertainment, grocery shopping, et cetera, et cetera. And then ecology as a key concept to actually uh, build more resilient cities, right? So how do we do it particularly in Septima? This is kind of the co-creation process that we built from the beginning. This is early 2020. And how even before having just one line or one uh, engineering decision, we've already engaged with a lot of people on the streets, right? We asked them for design proposals. And we tried to abstract and create these uh, design pillars that we would want it to then uh, come true and come forward with, right? Which we will see in a second. So that co-creation part, even before having a pre-feasibility, which is the most basic study uh, in, in hardcore engineering to, to pursue, that was useful for us to create a conversation, an aspirational conversation on where we should take this project. Right, and for that, uh, you can see on the right of your screen some of the strategies that we use. So we use this uh, open source platform called Street Mix, in which we actually had the real length of the street, which is variable throughout the 22 kilometers of of the project, to ask people, okay, this is what you have today, right? And you see around 163rd Street, what the 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 Septima Avenue looks today, and then we ask them, you can you can repurpose it, you can do our work. Right? You can then make the decisions of what you want to do and what you want to prioritize because our space is actually limited. Right, So we, you, we need you to tell us how would you do our job. And through a street mix, what they did with the exact same street wide that they would have in each of the points of the corridor, people would tell us. Right, And more than uh, 7,000 people actually participated in a around two week engagement in which we could collect a lot of data to kind of start directioning very difficult decisions, right? Such as, for example, uh, what we should do with private car space, because as you see, as you see, uh, what we have right now is basically private car space. And what people want, they want uh, wider pedestrian areas, they want biking, they want segregated public transit on ground, right? And they want more green. So there's a lot of things you need to do uh, and difficult conversations you need to have throughout the process to actually uh, discuss some of these concepts and then do a lot of like heavy traffic engineering to support these kind of decisions, right? But this was critical for us to actually give shape to a project that was different, not only focused in public transit, but also focused in sustainable mobility and pedestrian infrastructure, right? Which was actually kind of the huge uh, shift that we were trying to do. We're not doing public transit projects. We're doing something way more ambitious, which is integrating ecology and giving it space for us to be more resilient, but of course, allowing people to make better decisions on how they move throughout the city. Because if you accommodate better infrastructure for biking, better infrastructure for walking, and we'll see in a minute how that relates to proximity, then people will make better decisions as they commute, right? And then now in the detailed design phase, we did a lot of different engagement strategies as well, because as we were maturing the project, uh, we were we were then seeing how um, difficult things were coming up, right? And the major discussion right now in, in Bogota is how are we going to support the, the amount of people that actually want to move by private cars, 
and they don't want to, you know, do this modal shift of now using public transit or biking or whatever, uh, if they're having less space, right? So this kind of infrastructure is also, uh, discussion is super important and we've been having a lot of engagement. And then we're transitioning into construction where we want to have open channels for impact assessment and communication. Of course, all of this trying to, to involve people and to build some of this like culture and appropriation during the operation of the project, right? Because then we're going to have this new infrastructure, very nice, very expensive kind of to, to maintain and to preserve. And we need a lot of cultural appropriation and solidarity as the 15 minute framework uh, speaks about. Right. Quickly, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna um, use a lot of time in this, but this is how we created this input, right? This input into design pillars. So people were asking us, we, we want more trees, we want more security, we want more citizen culture, we want more biking, we want to walk, we want fauna, etc. Right. So we had like a very clear pillar around ecologic integration. We had a very clear pillage around pillar around sustainable mobility which is electric public transit, segregated bike lanes, multimodality, right? And this sense of place, how we're gonna use all of this remnant space that we're actually having because of the project. And what people want is more uh, programming, more public spaces to actually enjoy the corridor, right? Now talking about proximity, there's two different ways of understanding. Number one, of course, long trips. As I was telling you, the 15 minute city framework it's an aspirational framework in the end because you already have uh, like public and social infrastructure wherever they are and changing commuting patterns is going to probably take, I don't know, 50 to 100 years, right? Because most of the people want to go where uh, all of the jobs are concentrated and things like that. So in terms of proximity and long trips, what we want is, of course, pursue multimodality, right? But... Uh, what we want is for people that actually move more in a more sustainable manner uh, to actually uh, do it in a quickly manner as well, right? Today, a normal citizen is investing 90 to 120 minutes commuting through the corridor, just one leg, right? This is almost 240, 250 minutes a day to get to their working place. And, and of course, this this, this we want to change and just the, the idea of having new infrastructure that is interconnected to other uh, new projects that are on, on their way would be very useful for them to actually pursue uh, proximity in, in terms of time, of time savings. And then for short trips, this is critical and this is even closer to the 15 minute framework, right? Because what we want is for people that are actually doing short trips in an unsustainable manner, there's a lot of people uh, using their private car to move, I don't know, 800 meters, you know, to do their grocery shopping or to take their kids to daycare. What we want is for them to actually have dedicated space for them to enjoy the city within the corridor, right? And this, we call it the active and inhabited strip, which is having the accommodation of some infrastructure to actually be friendly for people to run, uh, or to enjoy the city, to use their bikes, but also to run errands that they normally would do in a more unsustainable artifact, such as a private car, right? To do it in a more humane and enjoyable experience. How to bike safely in a segregated bike lane or just walk around the city and enjoy the city. Most of the trips that are done in the most consolidated part of the city of Bogota, which is uh, the arrondissement of, of Chapinero, uh, they're done in private cars, right? So just if we do some of that modal shift to only optimize whoever really needs to do their trip in a private car, you know, <clears throat> an, an older adult or somebody that uh, has a healthcare um, condition or for a particular stream of work, etc., then the city would be more sustainable and really this proximity concept would be achieved. Right. And then finally, we have ecology, which is the integration of urban nature, right? How uh, landscaping design taking very, very seriously, uh, really including a continuous urban canopy, uh, totem trees, functional gardening, infiltration systems, water management, and what we call biodiversity aisles, which is having different strata of uh, endemic species, right? This is part of the work that we did with Agence Ter here uh, in, in Paris and in Bogota 
to really select uh, trees that are more useful for this ecotone and this connection between what's happening in the hills and what should happen in the river uh, down west, right? So there's a lot of like uh, ecologic sensitivity to landscaping for us to actually achieve some of the sustainable um, objectives that this project has. Now, and then finally, just to show you how this uh, looks uh, on the ground, we have our three pillars, which are the cohesive narrative to consolidate this project, as I told you, ecosystemic harmony, sense of place and sustainable mobility. The main innovation around this project is we're not only focused in trying to take people or force people to use public transit by having more infrastructure, right? We want people to have a better relationship with the built environment, with their built environment and the way they're using it. And for that, you need the three pillars to work and to this, like to connect and even to, to have a conversation depending on where in the project you are, right? These are the design guidelines responding to those pillars. Each of them, uh, it's integrated to the detailed design, right? So we have uh, urban furniture, we have public, public space, design, we have this canopy and biodiversity concepts, we have walkability, we have uh, healthy materials and places, we have also night lightscaping, which is critical and, and it's not very advanced in the city of Bogota. And then of course, materials and design decisions that prioritize whatever is more sustainable and achieves more the goals uh, of the project. So here you can see how, I mean, some of these uh, design decisions come to place where we have way more space, right, for public transit, uh, and, and we have this uh, permeability, and the, the corridor feels very, very walkable and secure for every single user of the road. You can't see the bike lane, but it's there, right? It's toward the, the lower part of your, of your screens between public transit and, uh, and the segregated uh, parking place we have uh, western part of the corridor and this is kind of the night landscaping strategy which is also critical for people to actually use some of this infrastructure uh, at night as well right so this is kind of the physical development of this active strip where you can see how people should interact in different uh, layers of the project and how biodiversity becomes key and how some of the operation of the project uh, actually works and here you see most of the integrated strategies and how now uh, these um, places are more walkable, more integrated. It's easier to connect by sustainable means. Uh, and you have kind of reduced uh, private car tra traffic to whatever it should be uh, just fair and useful for the trips of the city, right? Uh, today, most of the, the corridor is uh, occupied by private cars whereas they only um, imply less than 25% of the trips, right? So we wanna give them the, the space that's actually uh, right. So now to close, I know I've been uh, a little bit extended in, in this final part. I have some key reflections and limitations I really wanna share with you guys. So number one, uh, we do think green corridors are a key strategy to consolidate this 15 minute city infrastructure because they're participatory by design, uh, as they integrate from very early phases, uh, the conversation with citizens, but we also want to bring this solidarity and to consolidate this solidarity within neighbors and users throughout the structuring process, aiming to consolidate a better culture and usage during operation phase, right? Ecology is at the center of design decisions, resilient infrastructure, plus more space for cleaner uses of road, road space is critical for us. And then finally, of course, proximity is the aspirational goal, right? We want time reduction for long travelers, but also new possibilities uh, and new imagination how to use their space for short travelers, which is really the 15 minute kind of win of the framework. Uh, also, this project is a catalyst for urban renewal and first floor activation. So we want to repurpose current buildings and infrastructure for different uses that we're now, we're right now not not using, and this is also critical in the 15 minute city uh, framework. Now as a closing kind of uh, reflection, this is what this has been about in the last 25 years in the city of Bogota, right? We've been taking a winner takes all bet, right? In which we wanna aim for cultural change through infrastructure development. 
And this has shown as a very costly and high risk kind of activity, right? Because as I was telling you, the city has invested a lot of time, a lot of resources uh, into trying to materialize uh, these projects and it hasn't been successful for the last 25 years. So still public resistance to change is very, very strong. Public participatory intentions led by the city have also consolidated organized communities against the cities, right? So these people actually meet in public engagement uh, spaces and they start rallying, funding and attracting media to, organ to organize themselves against initiatives in, in, in the corridor. And then uh, another reflection is people really cannot wait correctly tomorrow's gains and, and the city's priorities or government priorities with today losses, right? How can we do it better? How can we help them to do better? We've done some things to try to have this conversation, but still this is a very contentious project. Uh, and we really would like to hear from you guys some ideas on how we can be more effective in that way, right? And then, Many direct beneficiaries of this project, which are lower income communities, these very long commuters, are not willing to invest any resources in defending the political agenda or the public agenda, right? Also, they, let, they tend to have less of these resources, right? So the question would be how to activate them without capturing their independence, right? We don't want as a city to just, you know, let them know like this, this is in your best interest. We want them to, of course, have their freedom, but to engage more actively in the project, which we think is absolutely critical. And then just this reflection from one of my teachers at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, which also mentored uh, Janet Sai Khan, which is probably one of the most transformative urban planners of our era. She served uh, as head of the uh, Department of Transportation in New York City during the Bloomberg administration for at least eight years. And, and Gerald Caden would say, uh, to plan is human, right? But to implement is divine. So how can we keep building these bridges towards more implementation uh, instead of a lot of discussion uh, to actually transform these people's lives, transform these behaviors, which is what this project is actually about. So that would be me. Thank you so much for, for listening to, uh, to, to our presentation. And I'm looking forward very much to, to knowing some of your thoughts. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Juan Pablo. Thank you, everyone, for um, listening. So uh, we can begin with some questions. So, Sadi. Yes, hello, and thank you very much. This is a, this is a fabulous project and fabulously difficult. So um, my, my, my feeling here, because you're, you're asking for uh, suggestions and how can we do better, right? So uh, my feeling here is that, I mean, nature hates a vacuum, right? So uh, if you don't offer something else to do, the, the transport business will continue to, to absorb uh, everything here. And if you want to resist this, which is apparently something that, that has been a problem in the past, probably you have to build and, and create some incentives. And, and uh, I mean, as a behavioral scientist, more or less, I'm always guided by activity. So if you want to go there at the moment, the only activity is transport, okay? Now, if there were cafes or kiosks or attractions or something else, I would want to preserve that place because I have an activity there that is not transport. So my, my, my question here is that, have you thought of another activity people can have here uh, that would not be transport and that would make them take you know, ownership and want to keep that place for something else than transport? Could I answer problems? I think yes, so, right? please. Yes. Thank you, Sari, so much for the question because that's that's critical to what we're trying to do. And probably, and, and one of my frustrations then as a public uh servant for particularly this project, and I'm gonna go back to one of the renders to to discuss what this is about. Uh, one of my frustrations is we really wanted, and it was like a Gale recommendation, and, and we had a lot of recommendations. So you need to give people an anchor way before the project is here, right? For them to appropriate of this space. And this, like, again, to implement these kind of initiatives is very difficult 
during a tenure in government, which times are very short and very demanding, and there's a lot of pressure and there's a lot of bureaucracy you need to navigate. So the reason why I'm showing you this is because actually uh, all of this infrastructure that you see in the in the upper part of of, of this rendering, it's actually um, land that we had to acquire for the project to fit, right? And this land is actually uh, not used right now. It's actually closed because there hasn't been a way for us to create some programming and some activation of these public spaces that would be wonderful once we're done, right? During like this public engagement and the structuring, structuring phase. So what Sari, what you're saying is definitely something that is critical for us because again, what we're the only way we could fit this in the time frame that we had was to you know do it uh, throughout and have a like a value proposition that was strong that that could integrate most of what people really want and aspire from the from from this corridor because part of the discussion was as well that actually people people want to you know to stay people want to enjoy. The corridor, as 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 they do with Broadway again, with Champs Elysees, or with any other uh, like key place, right? Key street that it, that actually identifies whatever happens on this street with uh, the ethos of the city, right? Right now we we weren't able, and it was a huge frustration for me. You know, the zoning the zoning alternatives are there for for us to do some of this implementation. We want it to happen. Uh, in the short term, we're actually using many, many new strategies for these public operators of public transit to actually build uh, new things to do and museums. And we've had a lot of conversations around that. But to do it during the structuring phase of the project, which I think is what you're suggesting, and I'm sure would be way more effective to, you know, to create a more solidarity kind of response using the framework. Uh, it's a huge frustration, at least for me, because navigating public administration is super difficult. And there's a lot of caveats, bureaucratic caveats that uh, were very difficult for us to actually implement, although we tried. Right. So definitely, I agree with you that these incentives of giving them places to actually do it more than just a pilot, because we did some pilots uh, to kind of show people how this could look like. Uh, it's a huge frustration, and I'm pretty sure like having easier paths towards those kind of implementations would be super useful uh, for the project. But thank you so much for, for the input. Great, thank you so much. Um, Alejandro, please. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Actually, you know, my, my mother lives in Rosales. So, and I, I participated a lot with like uh, people that have been working on this. Full disclaimer, your topic touches on two pet peeves that I have, uh, the 15 minute city and storytelling, like uh, persuasive practitioners and like how these stories get told in in ways that, uh, you know, like ignoring lots of elements also. Like I, I, I live half of my life in France and the people doing my policy in France, like Karine Gillette and Charlotte Good and the people from Atma and Fub, they're all like people that I work with. Um, so, sanitized storytelling, modernity, right? Like the picture that you, you show, you show a picture of the 20s where Bogota is already implementing stuff about cars and destroying the, you know, the infrastructure that actually, you know, that colonial city that was for walkability was already being destroyed. The whole, I mean, I would love for you to implement a Corredor Verde in the Septima, but this is, you know, it's a project in the long line of projects that I failed, as you mentioned, in the Septima. Um, and, and, you know, this is a tricky situation and you're in charge of the project, but when the major leaves her charge uh, by the end of the year, probably what's going to happen is that the next major is going to abandon the project. And it's going to be another one in that very long list of projects that failed. Nimbism. So, you know, the work of uh, Montero uh, about the whole position of the neighbors in the Septima. So, you know, and participation, like how do we do participation? So I used to go to Consejo Local as a participación before leaving uh, Colombia like 10 years ago. And the whole thing is it's expensive. It doesn't reach the right people. 
And even in Paris, people have problems with this. Like, you know, say, ask the people that live outside of the suburbs, like not the people that live uh, within Paris and Tramuros, what do they think of a, of a 15 minute city and how it is implemented in, you know, in, in, in the city. So there's one thing about how you tell a story about this to one audience. And, you know, this is like a fancy audience, you know, like, uh, you know, you have people probably from all over the world listening to you, professional people with good backgrounds about this. Um, it does not touch on topics like gentrification. So, you know, 15 minute city in Paris, problems of gentrification. Who can live in central Paris? Who can afford the prices in central Paris? Uh, who can afford living close to the septic in Bogota? It's the same, it's the same problem. And we do not talk about it. And, and the last thing, and I know, and truly, I want you to take this, you know, like, I hope that this is useful. I do a lot of bike stuff. I do bike stuff in the US. I do bike stuff in Colombia. I do bike stuff in, in France. Um, when the major Claudia Lopez went to Bloomberg Bike Week, maybe six months ago, a fr she asked a friend of mine to do the schedule for her, a guy called Mateo Carvajal, who works at this uh, fancy bike logistics firms in Amsterdam. She did not ask her own bike manager, Andrea, Maria, Andrea Mariana Barrete at the time, about what she would have, like, what does she need to do about this in the city? And so Mateo asked me, what should I tell the major? How can I do the schedule? And I asked Andrea Maria, but you know, she works for her and she doesn't ask the question. So once again, whose perspective is being represented and how and why? Because if you don't take into account all of these things, then the project is gonna fail. Sorry for that. Like it really comes from the bottom of my heart. Sorry. Oh, no, thank you, Alejandro, for for joining us. I, I mean, that's part of the huge discussion here, right? And that's why the reflections aim towards uh, the difficult manner of navigating power in the end, right? I think, of course, this is a an urban planning discussion, and 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 an infrastructure discussion, and and a sustainability discussion, etc. But in the end, it's just for at least the city of Bogota, I think it's a power discussion, right? And, and a vision of the city discussion. Because as well, like you can do a very similar project in Fifth Avenue in New York City. You can do a very similar project in Champs-Élysées here, right? But if you do it in Septima, it's insane. And, and, and there's a lot of caveats to that. And I, I don't wanna focus on that, but I just wanna say that definitely this, and, and the reason why it's interesting to do it, like to have this reflection and this space at IAS is because this is, you know, a sociological problem. This is not a technical problem, right? Uh, one of the first interviews I did as a, as a graduate at HKS regarding this project, the first thing I told, uh, I told uh, the person that I was talking to was, Septima has limited amount of engineering solutions right? But infinite amount of social issues and discussions because there's a lot of influential people living around the corridor because every single mayor or, or mayoral candidate will have their own take on what they should do. And that's why the city hasn't really moved forward, right? What we did here was try, you know, to consolidate a vision that was as inclusive as possible without undermining the real transit necessities of the city, right? Because in the end, you're doing a big, uh, you're spending a lot of money in this project. Uh, and in that sense, you need to try to find a good balance between all of the things. It's never gonna be perfect, right? Uh, when people don't like a project, they'll never say engagement was enough, right? Or strategies for public participation were broad enough or sensible enough or inclusive enough, right? But then uh, your closest enemy when you're trying to pursue these kind of results is status quo, right? And in the end, you have to you have to know and balance when you're falling into the trap of just pursuing status quo because you're you want to do perfect, right? And when you're trying to move forward an agenda that is really more holistic and integral and really kind of speaks to the understanding uh, of what we want to do. Right? And this is a little bit what we're trying to do uh, in this project. Probably is not perfect. There's a lot of contention. It will be forever. But again, uh, it, it's more a sociological and a political problem than it is a technical problem. Right here, we've discussed in a great manner some of the technical gains. But of course, these technical gains all aim for cultural change. 
which is what I think it's important about this project. It's not about if it's nice, if it isn't, if it's BRT, if it's electric, if it's hydrogen, if it has gardening or not, right? It's about how through these investments, we really try for people to start living their lives better in a city like Bogota, right? Great, thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll pick up on uh, some of uh, Alejandro's comments and uh, and Juan Pablo's uh, answer. Yes. Um, yeah, to focus a little bit more on the on the social sociological dilemmas that uh, Juan Pablo acknowledged. First of all, let me say it, it it really looks like a fantastic project, and you have you know the a, a great team of uh, of world leading experts working on it. So uh, it's really of you know it's really of the highest quality. It seems, but. Going back to this um, sociological, um, uh, main sociological issue, um, I have in mind um, a project that was um, uh, developed in, in Johannesburg about uh, 10 years ago um, uh, under the heading of uh, Corridors of Freedom. Uh, whereas your project is uh, is entitled the Green Corridor, right? And and that already strikes me as um, as a kind of difference in the in the social ambitions. Uh, related to the project in, in Johannesburg, you know, it was uh, it was intended to kind of uh, restructure the the existing uh, social spatial structure of the city due to apartheid planning, uh, etc. Um, and the main the main intervention aside of the BRT lanes that were proposed there was also a very big program of affordable uh, housing and really making sure that affordable housing are. Uh, intended to the to the lowest income um, uh, communities in the city, and turning that project into an opportunity of bringing people much closer to the center, right? So not just in terms of being able to uh, uh, to be to to take public transit and be more mobile and arrive uh, faster to the city center, but actually living there and actually creating. Uh, you know, mixed, uh, um, racially mixed and, 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 and income mixed communities. So I was wondering whether, you know, this kind of thinking um, uh, uh, was part of your project as well? Is it is it there somewhere? We haven't heard so much about it in your presentation, but whether it's there in the, you know, in the wider context of discussions, uh, how would a project like that lead to a, you know, to a more uh, spatially equal, equitable uh, Bogota, uh, in a sense. Um, and then one more question related to the uh, rela related to the ecological impact of the project as well. So was there also a study trying to um, evaluate just how much, uh, let's say, uh, carbon emissions a project like that would, uh, would reduce? Because it's one thing to you know, to show these wonderful uh, uh, green uh, green simulations full of uh, full of trees, and obviously there's a substantial impact to uh, to switching to public transit. But is there a way to kind of uh, um, uh, quantify that and um, link that to, also to a to an ambitious uh, you know climate action plan for Bogota? Because I'm 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 less aware of what's done uh, in Bogota in that sense. Thanks. Thank you, Nat, amazing questions. So for, for the first one, what I would say, which probably uh, I, I didn't include, I mean, even Paulius was texting me here, like, come on, come on, <laughs> you're done. You don't have enough time. So there's a lot of things we, we can discuss around this. And I think the number one, again, as you mentioned, the, the, the South African example, this is super aspirational, right? In the sense that most of the land that the city had acquired for, for further projects, which was, you know, a very classic heavy BRT uh, Bogota style kind of line. That was the only, the last project that actually Mayor Peñanosa tried to pursue at the time. Uh, we had a lot of like land pockets, right? To work with. And, and I'm, I'm gonna go back again to one of Martica's renders, which I see Martica is here with us. Uh, she's part of our team in Bogota. She's one of the most amazing landscape architects in uh, in the country and I'm very happy that she's here sharing with us right uh, right now but what we what we what we did here so basically uh, and uh, as a part of that conversation what we're lacking particularly in the centrality of 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 the city is social services which is crazy right because i mean it's mostly 
um, high income jobs, high income neighborhoods, etc. So the thing with spatial segregation uh, in Bogota is that all of these people have their own, you know, private oasis of schools, of uh, clinics, of uh, private clubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is not a lot of public infrastructure, right? So part of the approach that we had. Uh, more than just housing or or more than a housing approach was a public infrastructure approach uh, throughout the project, right? Uh, in a sense that most of the people that actually come here, there's uh, almost 800,000 people of floating, uh, floating commuters to this area, right? Uh, they come from low-income uh, communities, most of them, and they don't have any services around, right? So, so there is no, there, they have to travel all the way back or all the way throughout the city again, you know, to find where their hospital is or whatever, or where they, this huge strategy that the city is now pursuing called Manzanas del Cuidado, which is block cares, where there's this infrastructure equipped for uh, women, you know, to leave whoever they take care of, either uh, the elderly or the kids, uh, uh, and then the city will take care of them and, and uh, as they could, you know, learn some new skills, learn English or do or do some of the, the things they, they would do uh, at home, you know, in the sense of of giving them the most precious asset that they're losing as they, as they take care of others, which is time. Right. So most of, of the remnants of of this of this of our spaces were devoted to road space in the last project, right? So here we're uh, doing some kind of road diet to, to promote this public infrastructure, right? To have block cares, to have uh, new cultural spaces for all citizens to engage, you know, and start little by little using this huge um, money investment in colonizing not only high income communities, but also all other, all other uh, communities that work here into public assets, into high quality public assets, right? So that's kind of the approach that we've been taking throughout the project. People in the engagement process wanted more places to actually, as Ari was saying, to, you know, to stay and to hang out and to enjoy the city. What we wanted is to give them social anchors to actually have something to do as well that is useful for their lives, right? Either after work, you know, stay there and, and learn English and learn, um, I don't know, programming as we were discussing yesterday or, or Excel or whatever can move them forward, you know, uh, not, 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 not necessarily like a zoning perspective, but definitely that was super important for us. And then in terms of, of measuring carbon emissions or emissions uh, at all with all of this green infrastructure, there's a lot of gains. I, I don't have the specifics here with me, but there are gains like in terms of resiliency, in terms of how much this uh, landscaping infrastructure is able to absorb of the water that comes down from the hills, which is a vast amount, uh, and how that um, is problematic for the city and how this infrastructure will help in that sense. And even just, you know, projecting the amount of trips that are going to be zero emissions. Today, we have uh, around 6% of the trips being zero emissions, which is basically bike users, right? We're going to scale that to 87% of the trips in Septima are going to be zero emissions, right? That's super ambitious. And that, of course, has a PM, PM10, uh, PM35, et cetera, kind of reduction, which is huge. And we have some modeling around that. But in a sense, those are key, two key indicators I can share with you quickly on the spot that, that are important. We can definitely dig in deeper uh, throughout my stay here in Paris. But... But those are things that we are very sensitive to. And it's not only, you know, about having wonderful nature, but also uh, having a lot of strategies that are super integral um, to really have huge effects on nature-based solutions. Great. Thank you so much as well. Um, any other questions? We are almost out of time now, but we could see the last one if there is. Right. Okay. So I don't think there are any others. So 
Um, with that, thank you so much for joining. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a speaker series. So um, our next talk is on Friday, October the 6th. We will have um, Tamar Flash from the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel um, speaking on connections between our modeling work on space-time geometries and the brain. Paul Rosin from the University of Pennsylvania speaking about food worlds of French uh, and American cultures. And Virginia Valian from Hunter College um, about, uh, about whether executive functions are immutable. Um, it will be through the same link with uh, the same registration you already did. We will be sending uh, reminders of that and you can find all the program in the link I am going to leave on the chat. Um, and the recording of, of this talk will be available in our YouTube channel and in our uh, proceedings, uh, both available through our website. Uh, thank you so much for joining and see you next time. Thank you all for having me. Uh, and thank you, Paulus, of course, for, for the invitation. Thank you as well. Thank you.